So the good news is that we will be able to taste Kili Cafe during the pause. Now, Kili Cafe is a great story. And looking at the film, we wonder, isn't it possible to do the same thing with other products? Yes and no. <laughs> it is possible, I think, to the extent that there's a great lesson in the Kili Cafe story. I think, and, the, and the Swiss have really got it right in this sense. They've learned to develop the institution, this group, rather than just a few farmers or just a project. So that after the development agency leaves, after this money is invested, we have something that's still there, still operating, still giving benefits to producers. And I think that is certainly the most replicable aspect that we have. And I think furthermore, to enable them to expand to, even to other areas, this ability for them to learn to measure, for them to learn to really understand their own production. And like, there's, a, there's an old saying that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. And it's one, it's one of our mottos with COSA, with the Committee on Sustainability Assessment, that we need to really understand what is working and what isn't, and we need to have producers be partners in that process so they can select the best outcome for themselves. Okay, but it's working with coffee. Is there something specific about coffee that, that explains that it works so well? Well, coffee is interesting. Uh, coffee is the leader, uh, and people wonder why I, I work a lot in coffee, and, and I'm very much interested in food security and hunger, and people ask me why. Well, coffee is produced in 60 countries. Almost all of them are developing countries. It is probably the most important single cash crop in the world, traded in the world, ag agri agricultural cash crop. And why that's important is because producers and everyone increasingly need money, not just food, but to be able to pay the medical bills, to pay for schooling, and certainly to buy food and, and other necessities. So coffee is, is indeed critical. It's the leader. Coffee, by the way, was the first organic certification, the first bio certification, the first fair trade certification. So we've learned the first Rainforest Alliance, I think, certification also. So we've learned a lot of lessons in coffee about what we might do in the realm of sustainability. And now we're beginning to apply it in other crops increasingly so we can see the, the lessons there. And I just wanted to point out, if I may, there was a statement that it's, uh, fair trade is this tiny, tiny portion of global trade. And it's true. But in specific crops, it may surprise you when we look at all of the, let's call them ethical labels or sustainability standards, that today, 8%, between 8 and 9% of the coffee traded on this planet, all of it, is certified one way or another. In tea, 10%. In bananas, 20%. 20% of the bananas sold in are, the world, are, currently certified. are uh, fair trade or no? Very a small portion is fair trade. There are also other certifications. Rainforest Alliance is one of them. There are others. There, there are many ways of, and I think it's important to get that these are they're mechanisms. The end result is not to be certified fair trade or to be organic. The end result is to be sustainable. These are only one of the means. They are interesting means. They're potentially quite useful if they're well applied. But there are other means as well. So we need to look at all of the possibilities and not limit ourselves to just 1% of trade, but to see are there many other lessons we can learn that apply to farmers across the world. Okay, we spoke about coffee, bananas, tea. What about rice or wheat, who are so important when talking about hunger? Can they be one day fair trade or organic? Well, they can. Absolutely, and there's a lot of fair trade rice and, and organic rice and, and wheat and others. But I think more importantly, our goal is not to have them necessarily be certified. Our goal is to have them be more sustainable. And sometimes sustainability is different at different origins. We have different ways of finding sustainability. We don't want to limit ourselves to just one way as in, in telling everyone this is the right way. We, we, don't, we all have different approaches and we need to respect the ways that other cultures and other people see their own sustainability. But absolutely, I see no reason. It's only in the last 50 years that we've become very much out of whack with agriculture. For millennia, our agriculture was more or less sustainable. There's no reason we can't do it again. Can we just talk about labels and standards? We've seen uh, this example with Kili Cafe. 
it has a label. Um, for us in Switzerland, we have so many labels, Maxavelar, Bio, etc., etc. There's a lot of pri private labels too. Isn't, is the, the system very transparent and shouldn't it, it be more transparent? Transparency is a, a great goal that we'd all like to achieve in, in government, in our own relations, it's true. Um, I'm not a big fan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big fan of, of uh, the, the private standards. I, 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 I think that many of the leading companies have shown us that we can adopt standards when we choose a standard that is a public one. That's been agreed by consumers, it's been agreed by NGOs, it's been agreed by producers and industry themselves. Right? We see with Nestle's Nespresso, for example, right here in Switzerland, they have, they're moving toward a, a, a public standard for all of their procurement in the next few years. So if a company that successful, a multi-billion dollar, three billion uh, uh, CHF, uh, Swiss franc company, can do it, so can many others. <laughs> Talking about labels, are labels always good for little producers? Okay, in this example, of course, it's great because they have doubled their income. But is there like the black side, the, the dark side of, the, of labels? You seem like you know this sector a bit too well. Uh, there's always a dark side. It's, it's like uh, the uh, Darth Vader shows, you know, the, the Star Wars. Uh, for, for, for me, the, the journey to COSA to the Committee on Sustainability Assessment was the result of working in many countries in development and seeing projects where we've encouraged farmers to, to approach these labels. And in many cases, they had success. But in many other cases, there wasn't. They weren't successful. And so we started to realize that, well, they're not perfect. You know, we can improve these things a lot, but we didn't have information. We did not have a credible, scientifically rigorous way of measuring the economic and the, the environmental and the social aspects. Now we do, and with the support of, of the Swiss government and with SECO specifically in this case, we've been able to actually pioneer some of these measures in several countries, and we're beginning for the first time to get credible data that we'll share globally. It'll be a global public good that then producers can choose exactly the, the, the approach that best suits them. Because that's our goal, ultimately. Let me, let me ask you a last question as a conclusion. What would, could be the next step in development now? What are the main challenges? What is there to do right away? <laughs> uh, a lot. <laughs> Let's make it short. <laughs> are you, are you, have you had enough coffee? Are we, are we ready? We, we, we have a lot to do. But I think the first step for any investment, you know, and the Swiss government, I think, invests a lot of money in development, as do some other countries, and, and unfortunately the one I live in does not, but, but others do. And I admire that. And, and I think that the first thing we need to understand with any investment is what are you investing in? It's important to understand the impacts of our investments. If we're going to be sustainable, what really is happening? So the, for us in COSA, to have measures that work across different products, so you're not changing measures all the time with bananas and wheat, one measure. To have measures that work across different countries enable us for the first time to get the lessons we need to make the investments much more effective. So uh, that's, to me, acknowledging the fact that the Swiss were very, among the very first to see this idea, this need for innovation, and have actually financed it. So for me, that's important, because that's where the public and private meet. If we get to understand what really works in sustainability, then we can effectively convene the public and private partnerships, because companies want the same thing. They want their supply chains to be sustainable. Producers want to be sustainable. But we can't get them together to make the best investments if we don't understand what sustainability is. So we're coming to that, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, do, to talk about that. Daniele Giovannucci, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you with this, this afternoon.